pleasure to <laughs> thank you. This month, it gives me great pleasure to introduce one of our own, Paul Lehman, who is going to be talking to us about migrant and vagrant traps in North America. And um, I'm going to dispense a bit with the bio because, uh, one, it would take most of the program time to talk about Paul's com complete bio. But I would say that the first time I became aware of Paul was my, when I read um, Kingbird Highway when it first came out. And Paul was referenced in that book long before I knew who he was. Uh, also became aware of him through his work with the maps and the National Geographic, uh, Birds of North America. But the first time I met Paul was in the field. I had run across him, had no idea who he was. And uh, he was very generous in his time and assistance with birding. I think we all look forward to his daily bird email updates. Uh, those are an ornithology course, or at least a course in status and distribution uh, in, in and of themselves. And I save them and look back on them each year uh, to give myself a sense of what to anticipate. I know we're all very fortunate and very appreciative of all you do for us, Paul, both within the local birding community and the larger community. Um, and of course, your work on the pelagics is uh, is second to none. So without any further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Paul. All right. Well, welcome. We're going to leave San Diego and only mention it maybe once during the night. <laughs> we're going to go tour North America and we're going to go visit uh, many, but obviously nowhere close to all of the migrant and vagrant traps scattered all around the continent. And just again, a definition, everybody knows what a migrant is. A vagrant is a migrant that is appreciably far out of its normal range. So a vagrant is a subset of a migrant of birds that are quite a ways away from where they should be. I also want to say that you will quickly see that this talk, a lot of the places I went here was all during the 80s and 90s, uh, very early 2000s. I've been to a bunch since, uh, but I took a lot of the photos and, and were at some of these spots only in the 80s and 90s. So it's film. <laughs> you remember film instead of digital and you'll probably see that. But I would like to say that a lot of the scenery shots are mine, but only a handful of the bird shots are mine. Most of the bird shots are other people's. So I would like to heartily thank them in abstentia uh, from bygone years <laughs> of, of film photography. So uh, probably the ultimate small migrant trap, you know, what makes a good migrant trap? is a habitat that is attractive to a group or a, many groups of birds that is different from a lot of the surrounding habitat. So therefore it's where they all concentrate, it's where they all go. So one good example of a migrant trap is a boat out on the ocean. Uh, anybody who's been on a pelagic trip in spring or fall has probably had little land birds flying around the boat. And if they're tired enough, land on the boat. And this is a boat trip off of San Diego. I think we had a Townsend's Warbler that hopped around in the wheelhouse and, you know, so tired to let us pick up. So some of these birds, they're so exhausted, they don't care about, you know, the people standing on the boat. So there's a Wilson. Can you see my cursor, by the way? Yeah, uh, a Wilson's Warbler just sitting on the guy's head. Uh, so anyway, one of the highlights of many a pelagic trip is you're at a migrant trap for land birds when you're 25 miles offshore. But anyway, boats can also be a migrant or vagrant trap for seabirds, actually. Boobies, you know, love sitting on boats. Uh, a bunch of you were on a boat trip a couple of years ago and coming into San Diego, we went up to another fishing boat and there was a red-footed booby sitting on the bow, <laughs> riding it into shore. Uh, the ocean itself, by the way, is not this uniform oneness. There's really interesting variation going on. So you can get little micro habitats out there. And so, for example, the shelf edge where it goes from shallow to really deep or a sea mount way offshore could be an area that's, you know, a little micro habitat that attracts a certain group of birds. For example, Cook's petrels love hanging out at the edge of the of the uh, 
uh, shelf edge or even out at a seamount farther at sea, 100 miles out. In the last few years, we've been seeing them closer into shore, so we're getting them, in fact, on San Diego boats. Also, what happens is you can get little pools of water, little being, you know, 50 miles across or 10 miles across that are warmer or colder than other water around it. And so there might be a different group of birds there. And so back in the old days, we'd look for uh, warm pools of water off California to look for this bird, Creveris merlin. But I got to say, in the last couple decades, they're turning up now, you know, almost any kind of water earlier than they used to be. They're now leaving earlier in the late summer, fall than they used to. We missed them on the trips a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and in the old days, that was the peak season. So uh, things are changing. That's for sure. Anyway, so we're going to go on a tour around North America. Uh, the first thing you'll learn tonight that you didn't know is there's a huge fault that runs right through this part of North America. Uh, but anyway, we're going to start up in the Bering Sea in western Alaska, come down the coast, down the coast of California. We'll skip down here because we live here. And then we're going to jump over to Florida, go up the east coast. And then we're going to look at the arid interior west, the deserts and Great Basin, the arid western Great Plains. We're then going to look at peninsulas, and we'll look at the Great Lakes a bunch, and then some other places. So we're really going to travel and also go up to the Arctic of Hudson Bay and places like that. So islands, we'll start with true islands and why they're good. Of course, they're surrounded by the water. So any bird that doesn't want to land in the water is forced to concentrate on islands. And uh, the first one, a, a very famous migrant and vagrant trap is the westernmost Aleutian Island, Attu Island. And there used to be regular birding trips there, uh, but they stopped when they closed the one and only runway there when the Coast Guard left. And uh, they, because they all automated, so they don't need a Coast Guard station anymore. But you used to spend $10,000 to go there for three weeks uh, in late May, early June. And what you would do is hope for storms coming out of Asia to drop all sorts of Asian land birds on this island, which happens to be just barely inside Alaska. So you can count these birds for your North American or ABA list. This photo was taken in late May. There was still quite a bit of snow. But the, uh, this was the uh, Hilton Hotel we stayed in. It's an old abandoned <laughs> Coast Guard building. And you would ride around on little bicycles and stay here in this old dilapidated building for $10,000. But why you go there again, some of the resident birds, this is a nice rock sandpiper that breed all around the island. Or this is a cool different subspecies of rock ptarmigan uh, that's only found in the Aleutians, which is much blacker color than the typical rock ptarmigan. But that's not why you go there. You spend all this money to see Asian strays. So this is a regular Asian stray, occurs every year in numbers, which is wood sandpiper. Some of you may have seen the one last winter up at the San Jacinto Wildlife Area. Or a bird that occurs almost every year. This is an eyebrowed thrush. It's sort of the Japanese Russian equivalent of our robin. Or rarer still, uh, a common cuckoo. Maybe every four or five years, we'd get common cuckoos there. Or again, every seven or eight years, even rarer still, a red-flanked blue tail. Although one of these was at a library in Los Angeles a few years ago, all winter long. And then another island in the Bering Sea where I spent 20 years is, this is the Eskimo village of Gamble at the northwest corner of St. Lawrence Island. And this was a spring visit, my first visit there a very snowy year, snow everywhere. And this is what Gamble looked like back in the end of the 1980s. It's grown since now about 25% larger, but it's a pretty stark place when it's covered in snow. And here we are in late May with all this snow, but there are these isolated patch, these are bone yards where people 100, 200 years ago chucked all the marine mammal carcasses so it's now very rich dirt. And the poor land birds that got brought over here by a storm from Russia 
would seek out this area and try to find food in late spring, uh, it's still, you know, temperatures in the mid 30s and the like, but boy, it, it turned up great, great birds, but it's pretty stark if it's a snowy late spring. Uh, one of the specialty birds there that used to be regular, now not so much because of all the ice and snow was uh, ivory gull. Here's one eating some seal blubber. But you again would go there for some of these Asian strays. And my first year there ever, uh, one of the best birds was this male Eurasian bullfinch, a really rare bird from Russia. I go there in the fall. I went 20 years in a row. I haven't been now in a few years. Uh, and a very different bird life. It looks totally different. Uh, this is one of the regular strays. We get a two or three every fall or four is a, a gray tailed tattler. This is a juvenile, uh, the one some of you got to see on South San Diego Bay a couple of years ago was an adult. But in the fall, this is what it looks like. The tundra has all turned green and uh, you're, it, the birds are a little more spread out, but we get some really cool birds in the fall. This is an oriental cuckoo, extremely rare. And this was a first North American record I found in 1999, a yellow-browed warbler. And now there are 25 records. <laughs> we showed that with more fall coverage, the birds we thought were incredibly rare are in fact not as rare. This is the boneyard. Remember that picture of the boneyard with nothing but dirt and snow? Well, in fall, it's covered in this mint-like vegetation. It's a type of uh, sage. It grows to about a foot, foot and a half, even two feet, feet tall in some areas. So the birds have lots of places to hide, but that's the tallest vegetation is two feet. There's nothing taller than that uh, anywhere near Gamble. Moving south in the Bering Sea, this is St. Paul Island in the Pribilofs, a very famous migrant and vagrant trap, very popular, very expensive. Uh, birds you go there, regular birds to see. This is red-faced cormorant, one of the few places you can see red-faced cormorant. And it's the best place to go see red-legged kittiwake. Here's a beautiful adult red-legged kittiwake. And here's a one-year-old red-legged kittiwake with the dark in the head and the duller legs. And for comparison, there is a black-legged kittiwake like we see down here. So red-legged kittiwake, a really cool bird and only two or three places you can really go in the world to see them. But again, the, the highlight you go to a place like St. Paul is for rare Asian strays. And I was there in the fall and we had this juvenile little stint. So, uh, but it gets good lamb birds as well. Coming way south down the West Coast, we are now in California, the, probably the most famous island in California. This is Southeast Farallon Island located 25 miles off San Francisco, and it only has three trees. Well, it only had three trees. These two cypress trees, which have since blown down, uh, old Coast Guard building where the birders stay, and people who work for Point Reyes Bird Observatory stay here. I got to stay once one spring for about two weeks uh, banding land birds there. But there are no trees because of all the wind, and the third tree is this prostate Monterey pine, and they set up a trap here. This is called a Heligoland trap. It's a cage, and the birds go into the tree, and then you run over there and push the little lamb birds down the trap. And finally, at the very end of the trap, there's a little box where they end up, and then you put your hand in and grab the bird out and band it. They can't use mist nets here because there's no backdrop of vegetation and it's too windy. So that's why they use the Heligoland trap. So all sorts of cool birds are banded here uh, because there's no place to hide some of the most skulky birds that are hard to see anywhere else. The Farallons has a whole lot of records of. This is a Connecticut warbler, which you know there hasn't been one in San Diego in you know 30 years. And uh, there's a whole lot of records at the Farallons. It's a really skulky bird, but they can't hide there. This is a morning warbler, another skulky bird. There's only been a couple of in San Diego in the last 20 years. And uh, by the way, how, why isn't the McGillivray's, the uh, eye ring is skinny, skinnier and almost complete, and the yellow extends up into the throat. 
Another real skulky bird that hasn't been in San Diego in decades and decades, but there are a whole lot of records on the Farallones because they can't hide. There's no place to hide. This is great cheap thrush. And uh, many of you are, of course, just chomping at the bit to see one locally one of these years. Uh, the uh, single wing bar here denotes that it's a bird of the year. Uh, my spring visit, uh, one of the birds I banded was this. And I'll guarantee you, you've all, all, you've all seen this in San Diego, a bunch of, and you're, you may be drawing a blank, but notice the streaks on the back, the wing bars, a little bit of yellow, and notice pale feet, yellow feet. That's a female black pole warbler. That's what they look like in spring. Uh, bird I didn't see, but there's a record there too of Smith's long spur. Again, a skulky bird that can't hide there. But some of the rarities come from other directions, not only the east, they also come from Asia. They get Asian strays there and southern strays. This should ring a bell. This is a yellow green vireo for those who were at the zoo recently. And uh, the Farallones has had, have had a couple of the very few records for Northern California. But you can get some really bizarre combinations out there. And I don't know if anybody has figured out the significance of this photo yet. Nashville, Tennessee, and Kentucky. <laughs> so and, uh, <laughs> my little fun on that. And then another little fun uh, fall day at the Farallons. Notice what the, a fistful of all four members of the Zonotrichia sparrows of the United States. Harris sparrow, white-throated sparrow, golden ground sparrow, and white ground sparrow, all all simultaneous, you know, Farallons is a pretty unique spot. All right, we're jumping over the continent, an island on the East Coast. This is the Dry Tortugas, Fort Jefferson, off of Key West, a fantastic migrant trap, particularly in the spring, but also good in the fall, but nobody goes there. A lot of migrants coming from the Caribbean into the Gulf region in Florida, or from uh, even the Yucatan, if they hit a headwind or thunderstorms or they just get exhausted. And this is the middle of the fort with all this nice vegetation. There's a little water drip and it's a fantastic place. Plus it's full of frigate birds and sooty terns and brown noddies and all sorts of cool uh, tropical seabirds. When we were there, a uh, rare bird there, an Antillian nighthawk was spending the night on a branch. They looked exactly like common nighthawks, but they sound different. And then going up, I'm skipping a whole bunch of islands because to be honest, I don't have time or don't have the photos, but there are some really good islands up the East Coast, Block Island off Rhode Island, Monhegan Island off Maine is superb. There's several good islands on the Nova Scotia coast, uh, Seal Island, Briar Island, Sable Island. But anyway, this is an island I visited. This is Bonaventure Island on the coast of uh, Quebec. In the distance is the tip of uh, the uh, uh, peninsula there in the town of Per Se. But you come out to Bonaventure Island to see thousands and thousands of gannets and puffins and razorbills breeding. But I got off the boat and started walking over the hill to see the seabirds. And the first bird I saw in the trees here was a Baltimore Oriole, which is well north of their normal range. Uh, of course, it's an eastern bird, but this is way north. So again, you just never know. This is the middle of summer. And uh, here was a Baltimore Oriole greeting me on Bonaventure Island. Habitat islands are even more common than real islands. And again, it's a different type of habitat surrounded by inhospitable habitat. So one example is parks in big cities and Central Park in Manhattan. Prospect Park in Brooklyn. <laughs> Heck, you know, Balboa Park in San Diego, but particularly in some of the really massive cities where it's just all concrete and skyscrapers. And then you have a green patch. And so all the migrant land birds are going to be piling in there. This is probably one of the most famous from way back when. It's Mount Auburn Cemetery in Boston, where some of the early ornithologists started birding. But it's the idea of city parks as a wonderful migrant and vagrant traps. The arid west is full of habitat islands. 
patches of trees surrounded by something like this. This is Southeast Washington State, sagebrush desert. And this is Northeast Oregon, dry wheat country in Northeast Oregon, not, nothing really attractive. Now, yes, a bird could land in the wheat. It's not like the ocean where it'll drown, but it doesn't want to really be there if you're a tanager or an oriole or a warbler. So here's a little ranch house, you know, with a patch of trees. I bet you that's a wonderful little migrant trap and maybe gets a few vagrants. Now, a lot of that is privately owned ranches and you just don't want to walk up there unannounced. You know, you could get shot, <laughs> but hopefully you know the rancher and you can visit. Another example here in the dry interior northern uh, Great Basin, this is the Snake River in southern Idaho at a small dam, Bonneville Dam. Uh, not, uh, I forgot the name of it. But anyway, here's a state park right next to the dam. What a wonderful little spot. Nice number of trees. You can check the whole place in half an hour. Nice green lawn. You can imagine how attractive that is to a migrant going over an area looking like this. A couple of the even more famous migrant traps in the arid interior west. This is Malheur National Wildlife Refuge Headquarters in Southeast Oregon, uh, visited by the Oregon birders in droves every year in late spring and somewhat in fall. And the one time, one season I got to go there in late May, we were greeted by this little bird. And you might go, oh, well, who, you know, screech owl. Well, no, it's actually not a screech owl. The feet are too small. And look at that rusty color in the face. Anyway, that's a flammulated owl, which is a migrant. You know, they're highly migratory. And here it was, found a nice patch of trees at Malheur Refuge headquarters uh, as it continued farther north. And then south of Malheur, an hour or two hour drive, is this is the hamlet. Uh, the buildings are over here on the right. There's actually a little motel and a couple houses. And that's the uh, hamlet of Fields, which is the extreme southeast corner of Oregon, bordering Nevada. And this place has had more rarities per tree than perhaps any other place in Oregon. Lots and lots of first state records and second state records. And it's, it's really a great spot. In California, we have our examples of these isolated patches in the in desert environment. Oh, way in the back here, that's the east side of the Sierra Nevada near Bishop and Lone Pine and Big Pine. And this is one more range mountains over the White Mountains. Uh, and it's even drier. And that nice square there of green is a two year private college called Deep Springs College. And that was a hot spot for birders to go to all in the 70s, 80s, 90s. Incredible for uh, regular migrants and, and Eastern strays galore. Uh, they unfortunately have clamped down on access and now it's much more difficult to visit. And just uh, 15 miles from there up and over a hill and down to the next valley is this place called Oasis Ranch. And if you ever look at the literature, there's gobs and gobs and gobs of records of rare birds from Oasis, which is the southeast corner of Mono County, uh, right up against the Nevada line. Uh, this is, <laughs> yeah, the little, the bird, these are all birders here, Memorial Day weekend. You can tell by the cars, this was, you know, 1980, 1979. It's not as popular as it used to be. Again, there's a problem with access to some extent. Also, habit habitat degradation. But everybody who was anybody back in the old days would spend Memorial Day weekend with all these migrant traps in Eastern California, seeing all sorts of cool vagrants. You know, you go there and see a black-throated blue warbler, for example. And then just north of that, just inside the state of Nevada, it was the hamlet of Dyer, which for many years was the best place in the entire state of Nevada to find uh, eastern vagrants. But again, like unfortunately a lot of places, habitat degradation, a lot of this is drying up and the trees are dying, or properties that used to be open are now not available anymore. They've shut them down. So this was a private ranch we used to bird in Dyer and uh, incredible number of rare birds seen there over the years. Uh, this was uh, us assembled at that ranch. Uh, see who you can identify. This is probably 1980. 
Uh, three people, uh, John Sterling. Now here's a, a birder uh, from the era who was big in San Diego in the 80s, early 90s, mid 90s, Richard Webster, if any of you knew Richard. Uh, how many know this guy? <laughs> no pun intended. Guy McCaskey, 1980 about. And that's me, 1980. Little thinner, definitely more hair. Okay. But here we are looking, you know, something like a hooded warbler. It's just, again, just great for Eastern vagrants. And then farther south in Nevada, this is what it looks like outside Las Vegas. This is all creosote saltbush desert. You, you go here to look for Leconte's thrasher out and that stuff. Well, I took that picture looking that way, and then I rotated my body 180 degrees and took that picture. And it's a spring with got, uh, thousands of gallons of water coming up called Corn Creek Oasis. And again, unbelievable for Eastern vagrants. That's, it's, again, probably after Dyer, it's the second best place in, in, uh, in Nevada for Eastern vagrants and still open to the public. It's part of a National Wildlife Refuge property, still exists. And again, you know, why would you go there? Well, to see something really cool like a yellow-throated warbler. And then again, back farther south in California, the driest place in North America, the floor of Death Valley. That's, by the way, Telescope Peak of anybody who's ever been to the Death Valley area after a snow in November. But it, here we have the driest place on Earth, or in California at least, or in North America. And what do we have? An irrigated golf course <laughs> right in the bottom of Death Valley called Furnace Creek Ranch. And so you can imagine, we used to go walk around on the golf course, and people still do, although not as many as we used to, in 105 or 110 degrees, looking on in the grass, in all the tamarisk trees that form the dividing lines of the golf course, looking for migrants and vagrants. There used to be two nice date palm groves there, which were very attractive to birds, feeding on the dates or in insects attracted to the rotting dates. Unfortunately, they have removed a lot of the dates now and it's not a uh, date palms and it's not like it used to be in that regard. And you'd walk around the golf course and maybe you'd find a chestnut collared log spur or rarer still, there's a record of Smith's long spur or one of the most bizarre birds running around under the date palms in the date palm grove one fall for a few days was this adult purple gallinule. You can imagine if you're a water bird flying over Death Valley, there ain't much in the way of good habitat. There's some sewage ponds there at Furnace Creek Ranch where we saw a bunch of good birds over the years. This is the little sewage pond at a nearby place called Stovepipe Wells. But I once uh, was there, Richard Webster would have had a red knot there. I mean, a really good bird for out in the desert. But, you know, you go there and there'd be ducks and shorebirds and stuff. Hey, it's the only place, you know, any port in a storm. Uh, the Furnace Creek Branch uh, sewage ponds one fall had this bird, a gargany, uh, an Asian teal in a flock of cinnamon and blue wing teal. Going farther east in the desert, this is a wonderful migrant trap called Rattlesnake Springs in southeast New Mexico. It turns up all sorts of great birds to this day. Lots of really good vagrants, both Mexican strays and Eastern vagrants for New Mexico. Something like this, a Philadelphia virea. And then farther east still in Big Bend National Park in West Texas, this is Rio Grande Village, uh, surrounded by dry Chihuahuan desert, beautiful uh, cottonwood trees, great place for migrants and vagrants. And this was the site of the United States' first record of tufted flycatcher, which has now occurred a bunch of times in southeast Arizona, but the first record actually was at Big Bend. Another example of just a limited habitat type, this is Patagonia, this is Sonoida Creek, southeast Arizona in the wintertime. No, no leaves, but why would you go there in the winter when there are no leaves? Well, this is a great place in the winter with many records of Rufus back robin. 
uh, in there because again, it's an isolated patch of brush and trees surrounded by a much drier desert. Any questions? Okay. The Great Plains, same idea. The Western Great Plains in the arid rain shadow of the Rockies, short grass prairie, not many trees, but there's an isolated ranch house with some trees, undoubtedly a good little migrant trap for birds that like trees. Uh, what you would normally see out there in the prairie is this, a prairie merlin, the Richardson I subspecies of merlin, really beautiful pale gray and rusty below. But up close, you know, this was that patch of trees. This is an, an abandoned homestead. Looks like from the homestead era, this is the very southwest corner of Kansas. So again, you might see uh, maybe some Western strays for your Kansas list in these trees surrounded by short grass prairie. Now, another example of habitat islands is on the Gulf Coast where you have Right there where the cursor is, that's the open Gulf of Mexico. And then here you have coastal salt, salt marsh and the typical oil development you see on the upper coasts of Texas and Louisiana. So a bird coming in off the Gulf of Mexico that left the night before from the Yucatan, and maybe if it encountered unexpected bad weather en route, either thunderstorms, headwinds, a cold front, and you know it's then battling to make it to shore before it falls in the ocean exhausted. It's going to pitch into the first trees it can find, and it's just water and then salt marsh. But in a few places where there is underground salt that pushed up, you have these little hills that are 100 feet tall, which therefore are not inundated by salt water, and you get this growth of beautiful oak trees and, and other types of vegetation. And where this is, is High Island, Texas, a very famous migrant trap on the upper Texas coast, east of Houston, a couple hours, which is just inundated with birders in April and early May. All these birds come in across the Gulf exhausted. It's the first patch of trees uh, surrounded by salt marsh and ocean. And here we are at Boy, uh, at Boy Scout Woods at High Island, way back when, a uh, beautiful patch of trees surrounded by what you saw in the earlier photo. And you see all these great eastern migrants coming through, black-billed cuckoo, prothonotary warbler, and every once in a while a vagrant as well. Uh, now, they're also water bird habitat islands in the desert. Here's a famous one, the Salton Sea. This is an old picture. Guy can relate. This is the north end of the sea when we used to be able to get out there. And when the water was a better quality, just covered in birds. And here at the north end of the Salton Sea, it would track birds that had come out of the Gulf of California, got lost over the desert, and would then hang out at the Salton Sea, surrounded by desert. And I saw from right near here, Cook's Petrel, Laysan albatross, you know, least storm petrel. Guy has seen all sorts of bullers, shearwater, sooty shearwater, of course, lots of frigate birds and stuff. Uh, it's not like it used to, uh, unfortunately, it used to be a lot better before, again, the sea level dropped, the water became too salty and food disappeared, and there are fewer birds, tougher to get access although it obviously still turns up great birds. And over the years, it's had its share. It used to be a place, it was the place to go look for blue-footed booby and to some extent brown booby in California and the only reliable place in, in the U.S. for blue-footed booby. But it was only there every three, four years, it'd be a little push of boobies. No longer, uh, again, no food. And now we look for boobies in the ocean. Yeah, we see them there instead of the salt sea. Uh, one of the absolute rarest birds ever at the salt sea, and the southernmost record at the time was this Ross's gull that guy found there uh, many years ago. Other examples of water bird habitat island uh, would be, this is the Colorado River on the Arizona-Nevada border, just, you know, hot, dry desert. 
But they, what have they done on the Colorado River? They built dams. And this is Davis Dam, one of the larger dams on the Colorado on the Arizona Nevada border. And the tail race here, where the water comes out from the turbines, from where they generate hydroelectric power, there are fish that got pulverized that went through the dam. So there's lots of gulls here eating stunned and dead fish. And then behind the dam, there's a huge reservoir. You know, this is Lake Powell, uh, Lake Havasu is another example. And it's like a mini ocean that's huge. And so really cool water birds turn up, you know, for your Arizona list, your Utah list, birds like Sabin's gull, uh, here a juvenile or Jaegers or, you know, boobies and frigate birds. It's really cool birding if you hit it right. Another lake uh, in Nevada is Walker Lake. Again, a natural lake. It's not all just because of dams. And this lake has produced some cool stuff over the years. Uh, this is a, a similar sort of lake associated. This is a cooling water. This is a coal-fired uh, power plant in northwest New Mexico. And they, uh, the wastewater is thrown out, forming a lake. And then you can see there are birds all over it in the arid northwest corner of New Mexico. And when I went and visited it one day in late May years ago, many years ago, I found a white rump sandpiper there, one of the first records for western New Mexico. Some of these uh, little oases of water are tiny. And what you're looking at there is the entire body of water. It's a place called Quito Baquito, an organ pipe cactus national monument in Southern Arizona. And it was the site of the first Arizona record of least grebe. They hung out on that little bit of water for months. Peninsulas, almost like an island, three sides an island. And peninsulas can be really good. It's the end of the road for a lot of birds that are migrating. They keep going, they keep going, they keep going, and they get to the end of the line. And one of the more famous peninsulas uh, is this one, Churchill, Manitoba. So you're sticking north. This is Hudson Bay in June, early June, after a very cold year with still lots of ice. Uh, you've probably heard of Churchill as the polar bear capital of North America, but it's great birding. Uh, we went there a uh, way long time ago to see some of the breeding specialties like Ross's gull which uh, isn't there as reliably anymore, but it was for many years. But I went there once uh, with Guy and some others, and we walked out to the very tip. And here's this bird sitting on the wire. And I go, you know, we're in Manitoba, out in Hudson Bay. This shouldn't be here. Anyway, this is, a if you figure it out, it's a male violet green swallow. And it was the second record for Manitoba. So we found that. And again, you're at the end of a peninsula and some bird that just didn't put the brakes on and it's flying and flying, finally gets to the end of the line and says, uh-oh, <laughs> what did I do? Other peninsulas, this is uh, Nome and the Seward Peninsula in Alaska, home of many uh, interesting Asian stray. Although birders go there to see birds like this, this is a fairly white jeer falcon. Or this is a young Aleutian tern. It's a, one of the best places to see Aleutian tern. Or the northern tip of Alaska sticking up in the Arctic Ocean, Point Barrow, has turned up an amazing number of Asian strays and North American strays, including even things like Kentucky warbler and purple martin that, again, birds have forgot to put the brakes on and ended up in Barrow. Uh, other peninsulas going down the West Coast, Dungeness Spit in Washington on the northeast corner of the Olympic Peninsula. Turns up some really cool water birds like yellow-billed loon or storm-tossed red phalaropes. And coming down uh, points of Washington to get really interesting uh, shorebirds such as lesser sand plover, now, now called Siberian sand plover, that's a juvenile. And probably the most famous peninsula in California is this one. We like to think the Point Loma is, but actually uh, maybe we're second most famous. The most famous is this, Point Reyes in Marin County, just north of San Francisco. And there are no trees on the outer Point Reyes. It's too windy. But they did plant artificially these cypress, Monterey cypress trees and pine 
as windbreaks around several privately owned dairies uh, on, the, on the peninsula. It's now a national park property, but the dairies are still there. And those trees are where everything piles in. And, and the list of Eastern vagrants and a few Asian strays on Point Reyes since the 1960s is incredible. And that's you know one of the most popular places to go. So at one of those dairies in a slop pond, you know, we had a rusty blackbird. One of the most famous birds, horrible photo, but a great bird that came back multiple years in a row to Point Reyes was this Eurasian skylark, the first record for the state. And uh, brambling has occurred in that area a couple times, another Asian stray. But you get strays from every direction, north, east, west, and south. Uh, this is just your standard tropical kingbird, you know, going the wrong way up the coast, all the way to Marin. Or your, your standard eastern stray there, a, a Canada warbler. Other peninsulas, the Gulf Coast has several. This is Fort Morgan in Alabama, a great place. And of course, an Alabama birder would go there not only for regular migrants, but they want western strays. So we were there once and had one of the first Alabama records of black-throated gray warbler. So that's what they would get all excited about. And even more rare, uh, a red-faced warbler once in Louisiana on the coast there in the peninsulas of cheniers of vegetation. Uh, birds that are somewhat regular there that most birders get a kick out of. This is a shiny cowbird from the Caribbean. They've actually declined. They used to be a little more regular. Now they're rarer. Sometimes people put uh, pick a home at the tip of a peninsula. This is a, a birders who are at the tip of a peninsula in Pensacola, Florida, and uh, just have superb birding just staying in their yard all day long. The king of peninsulas, though, is the Great Lakes. And you look at a map of the Great Lakes, and here's our fall running through Michigan. But notice all the peninsulas. Here, this is Point Pelee in Ontario, famous place. Uh, Tawas Point, Michigan, right here. But up here, Whitefish Point, sticking into Lake Superior. And this one, which is hardly underburdened, is the Keweenaw Peninsula. So you can imagine the tips of these peninsulas uh, surrounded by lakes that are as big as an ocean, you know, really concentrate migrants and great for rarities. So this is what the tip of Point Pelee looks like, the southernmost point of Canada, southern tip of Ontario. And uh, you could just stand here and watch migrants streaming in off Lake Erie uh, first thing in the morning. But birders go there to enjoy the eastern migrants, you know, in spring with the scarlet tanagers hopping around at your feet. Or you go in fall where birds accumulate there before jumping off and heading across Lake Erie and here's a fall Cape May warbler uh, to enjoy. Uh, other peninsulas in the Great Lakes famous, this is Whitefish Point in uh, Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And this is Tawas Point in Lake Saginaw, a great place to go if you combine it with looking for Kirtland's warblers in late May. Another peninsula in the Great Lakes, this is Presque Isle, Pennsylvania the northwest tip of Pennsylvania sticking out into uh, Lake Erie, full of uh, thousands of gulls there, great place. And a place I actually lived for 15 years between my two stays in California, one of the most famous peninsulas in the United States on the East Coast is Cape May, New Jersey. And why peninsulas on the East Coast are so great, particularly in fall, is that you have thousands and thousands and millions of migrants heading down the coast. And if you get a cold front followed by northwest winds, that's the weather birds move on, it turns colder, they have a tailwind. But the fact that it's northwest or west, oops, means they get deflected out to sea. And there are all these birds that at dawn are out over the ocean and beat their way back in to shore so these peninsulas just are smothered in migrants if the conditions are correct. And Cape May is one of the most famous ones. Uh, long, uh, tip of Long Island, Montauk Point, uh, Cape Charles, Virginia is another one. Uh, one that's quite popular up in Massachusetts, this is Plum Island. 
It's really not an island. It's more a peninsula, great place for migrant land birds. And then probably the point of all points <laughs> is this. This is the easternmost point of Newfoundland, Cape Race, uh, near St. John's. And uh, if you are waiting for birds to come from Europe across the North Atlantic, this is where you want to stand and wait for a storm to bring strong easterly winds. And in the spring, they get things like lapwings and Eurasian oyster catchers and common red shanks and bean, uh, 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 pink footed geese and things like that. So it's just incredible uh, for European strays if the weather's correct. This is the harbor at St. John's, so it attracts some really interesting European birds. And uh, one visit there in the winter saw this. This is a common gull. It's the European form of our mew or short bill gull, now its own species, so this is a full tick. Another peninsula in Newfoundland is the one that sticks way to the north in Newfoundland called Lanso Meadows. You may have heard it because it's where the Vikings, one of the Viking sites, and I went there once, didn't have anything rare, but you know, a couple weeks before I was there, there was a laughing gull and a Franklin's gull there. Again, end of the road, <laughs> heading north. Ah, sewage treatment pods, how can we not talk about them? Uh, so you have these, this is actually a dredge spoil impoundment, but it's the same idea. They're fantastic for shorebirds and certain gulls. This is uh, Pascagoula, Mississippi. But this is your standard sewage pond, which really is a magnet for certain types of shorebirds. You can tell it's a sewage pond by the color of the water and by the floaters, but we won't go there. But anyway, this is a juvenile baird sandpiper, which loves sewage ponds. And, you know, I wish we had a really good sewage pond in San Diego. We'd get baird sandpiper regularly. We get rough much more regularly. This is a juvenile rough at a sewage pond. You know, we get them more regularly than we do. This is a juvenile sharp-tailed sandpiper at one of the more famous Western sewage ponds at Iona Island in Vancouver. And we'd get sharp-tailed probably more than we do if we had a good sewage pond. Curlew sandpiper after the misbehaving one in the salt works. Last month, you know, they love sewage ponds. This is back east. So the bird to the left is a semi-palmated sandpiper with a sewage pond loving breeding plumage curlew sandpiper. And then you probably know that sewage ponds, at least in the old days, used to have big flocks of Bonaparte skulls and mixed in with the Bonaparte skulls, you would try to get a rare gull like a Franklin's or something. But in the east, particularly, you would hope for black-headed gull and then this critter. This is a little gull, a young little gull. And there used to be regularly found, uh, even in California at Sewage Pond, particularly the one in Stockton, would get little gull and black-headed gull almost every winter for many years, though now they don't anymore. Both, uh, particularly little gull, has declined in North America in the last few decades, so not as many as there used to be. One of the rarest birds at a California sewage pond was this bird. This is at Lompoc in Santa Barbara County, and it was a male Baikal teal from Russia that spent much of the winter at the Lompoc sewage treatment ponds. Ah, uh, dumps. They're also, you know, little isolated, attracting migrant traps for gulls. This is the Chula Vista landfill way back in the 1980s when we had easy access to the Chula Vista landfill. And this bird was California's first or second Iceland gull, young Iceland gull, back when Iceland was separate from Thayer's gull, surrounded by California gulls. Now they've lumped them. Uh, but uh, the problem with landfills is they now have explosions and, and hawks and stuff to keep all the gulls away. They don't let people in anymore. so. It's harder to bird, but landfills are great if you like gulls. Uh, great for glaucus gull, which is what this is, a young glaucus gull. Great for Iceland gulls. Also good for the much rarer slaty back gull. This is a subadult slaty back at a landfill up in Vancouver. And that's where they turn up in California, but we can't get access to them. Uh, a couple of landfills up in the Bay Area, for example.
One of the most famous landfills in North America is in Brownsville, Texas, which is good for gulls, <laughs> but it's also the one and only place you can see what used to be called Mexican crow, now it's called Chihuahuan crow, just gets into that little southern tip of Texas at the dump. Uh, waterfalls, all the fish go over the falls and get pulverized, and so it's below the falls. There are thousands of gulls feeding on dead fish, so it's another gull magnet. This is Niagara Falls, if you hadn't figured it out, and that's a superb place for gulling. And... Uh, People go there to see uh, Thayer's gull uh, in the eastern edge of their range. Uh, Thayer's on the right for a cycle and a herring gull on the left. And uh, we're getting there. We're almost done. Migration corridors. Rivers act as migration corridors, primarily for water birds. This is the upper Mississippi River in southern Minnesota. And again, it would act as a corridor for major movements of water birds. Uh, this is the Susquehanna River in southeast Pennsylvania, and it acts as a corridor for some water birds like Scoters and Brant, which winter on the Atlantic Ocean and want to head to Hudson Bay. And instead of going the long way around, they just do the straight line to Hudson Bay over land, and they start by going up the Susquehanna River in spring. Another major migration corridor on a river, this is the Columbia River in the uh, Columbia Gorge on the border of, of Oregon and Washington near the Dalles. And uh, all sorts of really cool water birds trying to get from the interior to the coast or vice versa are traveling along the Columbia River. Again, things like scoters and loons and rare gulls and all that kind of stuff. Uh, ridges, ridge lines. This is the Appalachians in Western Maryland act as corridors for hawk migration. Why ridges? Because uh, updrafts, the wind hits the ridge, forced up, and so it's all these updrafts during the day, and it keeps the hawks af afloat without much effort. And so they use the Appalachians as a major migration corridor. And this is one of the most famous Appalachian hawk migration sites. This is Hawk Mountain in Pennsylvania. It was one of the first ones, and uh, just thousands and thousands of people have gone there over the years. And th what you're doing is you're looking northeast here up the ridge line, and the hawks are coming straight at you. And so they just pass right by this rocky outcrop, and you get all these hawks that go by all day long. And uh, a little funny story, they, they count the distant ridge. This is uh, hump one, you know, hump two hump three, four, five. And so you'd call out, goshawk coming on uh, number, goshawk over number two, you know, uh, uh, golden eagle coming at number four. So everybody would know where to look. And I was there as like a 14 year old kid on one of my early uh, Audubon field trips from New York. It's about a two and a half hour drive here. We went there one day to look at all the great hawk migration. And there was another Audubon group sitting right next to us. And the leader in that group was calling out stuff right and left. And he would say, Cooper's hawk over number two, you know, sharp shinned hawk over number four. And I'm turning to my leader and I'm saying, what? At that far away, you know, how is he doing that? And he says, let's find out. So my leader and me alone went to the, the other leader and pulled him aside and said, God, you know, I'm still learning hawks. How the heck could you tell that was a Cooper's hawk over number three? And he turns to me and he says, son, you're only as good as the people in your group let you be. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I learned that I wanted to be a bird tour leader at that moment, that that's, you know, that's uh, how to fool, you can fool everybody. Anyway, okay, feeders. The last hot spot for rarities. Well, you know, I can't tell you, know, how many of you have not ever gone to somebody's feeder to see a rare bird? Almost nobody, everybody goes to somebody's feeder, be it a Harris Sparrow, like, you know, the one this last winter at Max's yard at his seed. Uh, but, uh, you know, Harris Sparrows, white-throated sparrows, hummingbird feeders. I mean, there's been an explosion of 
feeders, seed feeders, hummingbird feeders. And what's really a sort of an unknowing, an unanswerable question is how many rare birds are at feeders in any given year, at any given time that you never hear about, that us birders never hear about? You know, the, the owner of the feeder is not a birder. Uh, they couldn't tell a Harris sparrow here from, you know, a condor, probably. They certainly, a bird like that would blend in with all the male house sparrows, you know, they wouldn't know. So you can imagine how many, you know, how many female ruby-throated hummingbirds turn up at hummingbird feeders that nobody ever identifies. Well, <laughs> almost all of them. But anyway, feeders are fantastic. Uh, seed feeders. Uh, this was a feeder in Santa Barbara many years ago. I went, somebody had a male rose-breasted grosbeak at their feed. This is late winter. And we went there <laughs> and on one feeder was a male rose-breast and on the other feeder was a male blackhead. And it was late winter. Even the blackhead was rare. Uh, you, you just never know. But hummingbirds, you know, God, just hummingbird feeders everywhere. And I once was birding in coastal South Texas, uh, right near Corpus Christi. And I got a call uh, saying, somebody just reported, is not a birder. They have a bizarre, they said they don't, can't figure out what this hummingbird is. So several of us are going to go check it out. Would you like to come? I said, sure, I'll come see what it is. You know, we were half expecting a black chin or something, not so, or rufus, which are rare but regular in the coastal Texas in winter. And in flew this thing. <laughs> that's like, what the... Anyway, that's an immature green-breasted mango. And at that time, it was the second uh, U.S. record. There have now been 20 records. But, uh, yeah, you just never know what's going to turn up at feeders. And uh, finally, uh, one of the rarest hummingbirds ever at a California hummingbird feeder. This is a Xanthus hummingbird, an endemic hummingbird from the southern tip of Baja, and one of only a couple records for California. And this one uh, stayed all winter at these hummingbird feeders in Ventura, now way back in the 1980s. And I want to finish with the idea that sometimes vagrant traps are not the prettiest and most obvious <laughs> in the world. Uh, this bird that we're about to look at may predate a bunch of you, but this is San Diego. This is a dumpster in an apartment parking lot right behind Sports Arena. So that is here. That's Interstate 8, right behind the parking lot. Uh, you're east of Rob Field by a mile or so, right near Sports Arena. And there was a really good birder who was visiting his dad in the apartment. And I guess he stopped to throw the garbage in the dumpster as he walked across the parking lot to catch a bus and looked in this bush and went, oh my God. And there in that bush was this bird, which is a mangrove yellow warbler. It's a subspecies. They keep saying they might split it, but they probably never will. So this is a bird of mangrove coastal forest. Uh, you have to go down to you know central Mexico you know, to get them, and then from there down through the Caribbean and, and Central America. And this thing spent all winter in that bush because it kind of did, it was a Mayaporan bush. It sort of looked like the same structure as a mangrove tree. Uh, but, you know, you just never know <laughs> what's, you know, it, just a bush by the I-8 freeway can be a vagrant trap. So we did our trip. We went around the, the uh, fault has now shifted. 90 degrees going north south, but we've been to Alaska, down the coast of California, Florida, up the east coast, the Great Lakes, the Great Plains, the interior arid west. We've been everywhere. So hopefully you've gotten a sense of some of the cool migrant and vagrant traps, what they look like, how to find them and recognize them if you're out exploring on your own. And needless to say, we have plenty of them in San Diego. Uh, but I figured we'd look elsewhere on this talk. So thanks a lot. That's it. Thank you, Paul. I um, just made a list of how I'm going to spend all my frequent flyer miles in the coming year. <laughs> Any, um, well, I, I guess one thing I've, I've neglected to mention at the beginning, uh, Paul's latest tome. Can you see me all right? <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, so this is uh, Paul's latest book. It's about one of the hot spots he just mentioned. It's uh, Gamble, uh, Gamble in St. Lawrence Islands. Western Field Ornithologist published this. It says copyright 2019, but I feel like it just came out two years ago. Is that is that right, Paul? Did it just come out more recently than that? No, 2019. Then they did a second printing a year or two later. Ah, so it was a second printing I must have purchased. So <laughs> Grace is my bookshelf yet to be read, but... Um, <laughs> But, Hopefully uh, you'll get there at some point. No doubt, no doubt. Any questions for Paul? I know one place you didn't mention, Paul, um, well, a lot of places I'm sure you could have gone on all night, but Butterbreck Springs out uh, in the, I guess. It's, uh, the, yeah, the Mojave Desert, Eastern Kern County. Yeah. It was the of... first place that was discovered for the concept of morning flight where you get this mass of birds moving by in the first hour or two in the morning. And it's also had lots of Eastern vagrants. Uh, since then, we have learned that morning flight is a much more widespread. And of course we do it at Mount Soledad here in San Diego. And of course you, everybody's heard of Bear Divide in LA when you've had talks about it. Uh, so anyway, so that's uh, part of the problem, it's like Monhegan Island, Maine, one of the best islands in North America, or I just don't have, I, I forgot to take a picture. I've been to butter bread a million times, but I forgot to take a single damn photo of the place, so therefore it didn't make it. And of course, as you said, if I mentioned every place that's good, we would be here all night. I haven't been there since the 90s, but I'm curious what kind of shape it's in uh, today. Questions for Paul? He's all ours for a few more minutes. <laughs> oh, I see. It's true. Yeah, go ahead, Mary. Yeah. This is not a question. I just want to say this is the most wonderful program I've ever seen. <laughs> and it had everything in it. It's like an encyclopedia. <laughs> it was fabulous. And it makes it so obvious that you were a superb teacher. You know, the way you say things in the out in the ocean are analogous to things we know about on land as far as structures and islands. And so. This was superb. I think this should be archived forever. <laughs> well, that's the, well, I guess we'll archive it. Yeah, Thank a lot you. of these places were discovered starting in the 60s, accelerated 70s and 80s. But I'll tell you, some of this stuff is still being discovered in just very recent years. It's not like we all knew it already, you know, 40 years ago. The whole idea of morning flight and that whole idea of migrant streams of migrants has really only come to the fore and how widespread it is in the last 10 to 15 years, you know, in, in a lot of places. I mean, we knew about it before at Butterbread. We knew about it in the fall, in the morning at Cape May or Cape Charles on the East Coast. But all these other places, you know, up and down the California coast and you know, in downtown Tucson, there's some places people are seeing it over their house in Tucson in the morning and spring. You know, it's really so it, there's still stuff to be discovered. Yeah, there's always more. Thank you so much. Mary Karens, I saw your hand going up. Yeah, thanks. Um, I have two, kind of a two part question. Uh, the first part is, are a lot of the vagrants um, cause vagrancy um cause because of weather that's the first question the second one is it has there any uh, has there been any studies where they've um looked at statistically uh the makeup of vagrants and what i mean there is male versus female juvenile versus adult you know yes whatever, yes you know, yes just... <laughs> yes and yes um, some places, weather plays a, by far a, a major role. Storms coming off Asia, across the Bering Sea, drop big fallouts of Asian birds at Attu, St. Paul, Gamble. Although you also get birds turning up at Gamble on nice days that are 3,000 miles away, and it's because they're oriented totally in the wrong direction, which is how a lot of vagrants get here. California, where we don't have massive, huge storms, uh, per se, a lot of the birds are simply misoriented. Either they're hardwired wrong and they go the wrong way, 
They go mm -hmm. east instead of west, or they go southeast instead of southwest. Mirror image uh, is a common way to go wrong. And so they end up in the wrong place. But, you know, the weather is, hey, it's Southern California. It's benign. So it's not like a big storm. Now, obviously, we did get, you know, Tropical Storm Hillary a year ago exactly today. We were starting to see least storm petrels and wedge rooms. Well, there's there's a weather event dropping rare birds. But but normally, California, it's mostly misorientation, you know. And that's a mix in a lot of places of both. And as for uh, differences in sex, they have found that on average, most vagrants, it seems, are males more than females. But whether that's because they're more likely to just go out to forge new ground or something, or they're more likely to be singing if it's springtime, or they're only going to be the one so that you find them. If it's a quiet female, you overlook it. If it's a singing male, you find it if you're mm. a bird or, you know, uh, or, you know, the, whatever. So whether that's a real difference or that's just we find more males than females. And in the fall, absolutely a huge percent are young birds. First year that they've migrated, they're the ones making the big mistakes. Unfortunately, there's a pretty good mortality rate of these birds, you know, if you end up on an island, you know, your next time you fly, you're probably a goner out over the open ocean. And so there's a high mortality rate of a lot of these birds, so they don't live to see the next year. So a lot of, but not all, not all of them are youngsters, but a large majority. And then the next spring, probably a lot of the ones we see at a range in California are first year birds that are doing their first spring migration back from the winter grounds and they get screwed up. The, male, the, the males don't stop and ask directions, Paul. <laughs> yeah, that's it. And the males don't ask for directions, so they yeah. get lost. You're right. Luke Keller has placed <laughs> a link in the chat about a, a podcast about Cal City, uh, which also you know has, has hosted its share of rarities over the years. Oh, Cal yeah. Hill, which is no longer a, a, a going concern out there, but the Calileo Hill yeah. quite a No, there used to be in the 70s, 80s, 90s, Everybody went out to the, either the Kern County Desert or the Inyo Mono Death Valley Loop, or both. And uh, very few people do so anymore because of uh, totally losing habitat. You know, they stop watering, trees died. The areas that were open to the public now are closed, et cetera. And it just, you have fewer places to go. It's not worth a four hour, six hour drive that it used to be when you stay local, you know, so it, it's changed, you know, where birders go now. Dan King. Hey, thanks, Rick. Paul, this was great. Um, I I was remembering a story when you were talking about rivers being a, you know, sort of a, a, a conduit. <clears throat> I'm going to post in the chat this crazy eBird checklist. And Paul, I know you've probably read this. This is in Quebec. At, it's called Tadoussac Dunes. Yeah. Um, Lawrence River, and the guy saw like 500,000 birds in a day, like 100,000 Tennessee warblers went by. Right. Uh, super cool. It was, uh, he wrote it it up. was yeah. light awesome. rain, mm -hmm. so the birds got disoriented. They, they, you know, there's a lot of the birds uh, use the stars to navigate at night, so if it's cloud cover, that's why if we have marine layer here on the coast, we do better for oddball birds you know, at Point Loma, if we have an overcast, was they can't use the stars to navigate. And so they, but a to-do sack, that may be birds coming in off the Gulf of St. Lawrence and the very wide St. Lawrence, rather than they came down that big river there, the Saguenay mm -hmm. River or whatever it is. Or maybe it's a fact that both are there and it combines to just have these incredible, yeah, I mean, staggering numbers of birds that, yeah, you know, and that was only discovered in the last ten years. That place, right? For and so, place. you know, I mean, I it, it was sad to hear you talk about some of these super cool places. You know, kind of from the archives that are no longer uh, available. But like you said, this to do sock place is you know it was discovered recently, and so there's no doubt other places like that that we just haven't haven't found yet. 
really cool. Anything else for Paul? Good deal. Well, thanks again, Paul. That was great. Really appreciate sure. it. Learned a lot. And like I said, I'm making my plans for next year. <laughs> uh, hope, hope to see all of you next month.